Hello and welcome. Today we'll talk about affective characteristics and we'll really discuss in detail your first lab assignment. So, so first off, why would you assess affective traits? Why is that important for educators? So the first thing is there's a link between affective and learning, right? that we know that the way that students feel and their emotions and their self-concepts and their interests all affect the way that they learn in the classroom, right? And that affects your relationship with students. So we've all experienced it, the one that when we like a teacher, when we have positive relationships with teachers, that we work harder, that we learn more in those classes, right? Um, and it can also help us shape optimal learning environments so that we know that students have specific interests, that they have specific things that might help them learn better, and that knowing those things can help us shape the learning environments to optimize those learning experiences for our students. And it can also help us with differentiation. So if we know that students have specific interests, then we can manage our learning environments to help meet those needs of our students. So now I'm going to go through a quite a few different affective traits. It's not super important that you know the differences between each and every one of these traits, but I do want you to kind of think about the different possibilities and because you'll be selecting one of these traits to assess in your lab um, this week. So the first one's attitudes. And attitudes are basically a predisposition to respond favorably or unfavorably to specified situations, concepts, objects, institutions, persons. So for example, I might have um, attitudes towards math or attitudes towards science or even attitudes towards addition or subtraction, right? Um, for example, attitudes about reading, or even more generally, attitudes about school. Um, items on this type of assessment might be, I like school, or I like to read, or um, going to school is fun, right? Um, interests. So interests are a little bit different than attitudes. Interests are personal eagerness to pursue activities or ideas. So um, I might have an interest in mathematics. But we oftentimes think of interests um, um, more specifically, so interest in specific things, like an interest interest inventory might be more broken down by subject area. So um, an example of, a, of an item under interest might be learning mathematics is fun. Values. Values are the usefulness of concepts, content areas, or areas of study. So um, for example, the utility value of mathematics. So do I find mathematics useful or do I think that it will be useful for me in the future? So an example item might be, I think that learning mathematics will help me in my future career. So I might not be interested in mathematics, I might not love mathematics, but I might be motivated to pursue mathematics because I think it will help me later on, right? Um, motivation. So motivation is a tricky one to measure through a survey um, because it's usually measured more through our behaviors, more what we observe. But we can think about motivation, um, which is our desire and willingness to be engaged in behavior and also the intensity of our involvement. And remember that we could think about motivation as both extrinsic and intrinsic, right? So what's the difference? So extrinsic motivation is when we are motivated to do something for extrinsic rewards, like I'm motivated to go to work because I get a paycheck, right? Or I'm motivated to read books because I get a piece of candy after I've read every book, right? And intrinsic motivation is internal to myself. So I'm motivated to read books because I get enjoyment from reading. I'm motivated to solve math problems because I feel good about myself when I finish solving a math problem, right? And ultimately, we'd like to increase students' intrinsic motivation for doing schoolwork, for learning, for being involved in school, right? Um, this is really difficult, like I said, to measure with a self-report survey. Observations are usually more helpful in, mo in measuring motivation, but it is an affective trait that we are super interested in as teachers. Self-efficacy. So we're going to talk about three different traits. We're going to talk about self-efficacy, self-concept, and self-esteem, so we can keep them straight. Self-efficacy is our self-perceptions of capabilities to complete a specific task. So when we talk about self-efficacy, we're really talking about something really specific, like I have self-efficacy in my ability to multiply fractions. Um, an example um, of a self-efficacy item would be, I know how to compute the area of a circle if given the radius. I feel confident in my ability to add 
fractions, right? I know how to calculate the square root of a polynomial, right? Those are all specific tasks that I could be self-efficacious about. A little bit more broader is self-concept. Self-concept is my self-perception in a specific domain. So I can talk about academic self-concept and even more specifically mathematics self-concept or reading self-concept. I also have social self-concept and physical self-concept. So how I feel about myself um, in making friends or how I feel about myself um, and my physical appearance or how I feel about myself and my physical abilities, like my um, athletic abilities. So some sample questions would be things like, I'm good at learning mathematics. I'm a good physics student, right? I'm a good student. I make good grades. All of these would be measuring academic self-concept. So it's a little bit broader than self-efficacy because it talks about my kind of my that whole domain of self-concept. And finally, we have self-esteem. And self-esteem is the most general of the three selves, right? It's our global attitude towards oneself. It's our degree of self-respect, worthiness, desirability of self-concept. Um, and self-esteem had a lot of growth in like the 1980s. We were really concerned about student self-esteem and growing student self-esteem. And really what we found out is that it's really more important to grow student self-concept. So can we build their academic self-concept in specific domains? And that will help them become better students. Of course, we want students to feel better about themselves. But the best way to build self-esteem is through specific areas of content. Okay. But a question, an item that would measure self-esteem would be something like, I'm a good person. Okay, locus of control. Hopefully you guys remember locus of control from maybe your psychology classes. But locus of control, control is our self-perception of whether success or failure is controlled by the student or by external influences. So if I have an internal locus of control, then I believe that bad things or good things happen due to my own sense of self. And if I have an external locus of control, I would believe that bad things and good things happen to me because of outside forces. So most people have a mix of both. Um, really healthy people think that good things happen because of their own self and bad things happen because of external things, right? So um, let's say I get a good grade on the test. That is because I'm an amazing student and I studied really hard and I'm really smart, right? And if I fail a test, it's because the test was really hard and my teacher hates me and it's certainly not my fault, right? What we'd like really is to develop students' um, internal locus of control, really to have them think about how they could help solve those problems, how they could help develop themselves, and that, that if they stayed harder, they could control the outcome, right? And this is kind of related to Dweck's theory about malleable and fixed intelligence, or I think you've heard of growth mindsets, hopefully. And we think about growth mindset, we're really thinking about, do students believe that if they studied harder, if they worked harder, they can get better, that they can become smarter? And although we believe that intelligence is pretty fixed from a theoretical standpoint, we do know that students who study, who work, can get better at learning things, right? So students who believe in a growth mindset will persist longer. That if I believe that I can get better at math, I'm going to study math longer and I'm going to work harder at learning math. So we'd like students to have that growth mindset. So that's another thing that you might be able to measure through a survey. Um, so I'm going to have a little stop sign here and give you a word of caution about a couple of affective learning traits that don't have a lot of support in scientific theory. So the first one is like learning styles, right? So I know that lots of people are very fond of learning styles, but again, it falls into that category of pseudoscience, right? There's no scientific evidence that supports that students have specific learning styles, right? There's no visual learners. There's no evidence that some people learn better by hearing things and other people learn better by seeing things, right? But we do know is that every student learns better when given things in a variety of contexts. So everyone learns better when they hear things, when they see things, when they read things, and when they get to try things out on their with their hands, right? So learning styles, not a thing. So we're not going to measure students' learning styles, right? Another one is multiple intelligence theory, Howard Gardner's theory about um, visual spatial learners and musical learners and verbal learners and mathematical learners. And again, there's just no evidence to support that these intelligence are associated with the different parts of the brain or that different people 
have these innate different types of intelligence so they are different types of growth trajectories. Of course, people have different areas of talent and those different areas of talent can be developed separately, but we're not going to develop um, learning as effective assessments based upon these multiple intelligence theories either. Stick to the, to the affective traits that I listed here in this course. Okay, so we're going to think about really what does research support. Okay. So there's quite a few ways that we can measure affective um, characteristics. Let's see if I can move this over so you can see. There we go. So we have structured observations. So that's a way in which you could very formally observe students and take a note of what they're doing in class, right? Um, and there's checklists, which would be really similar. We could have a list of behaviors we were looking for and check them off as we see them. Um, for this class, we'll be using self-report. Um, so self-report um, has some disadvantages, right? Because we're relying on what the students say. There's sometimes a tendency for students to respond in the way that you think they want you to respond. So we're gonna try to keep them really anonymous. That way students aren't apt to give us the answers they think you want. Um, and those can be through questionnaires and surveys. Um, they can be constructed or selected response. And we'll, you'll have the option of choosing either constructed or selected response for your um, lab report this week. So, let's see. Oh. Go to the next slide. So, surveys. Um, so you can have researcher created surveys that have been validated. They've gone through reliability and internal consistency measures. They're really suited to some good research methods. Um, however, they have the disadvantage of maybe not really being applicable to your classroom or your grade level or being developmentally appropriate for your students. So for this class, we're going to use teacher-created surveys. I want you to write your own. They can be really crafted for your classroom needs. They can be developmentally appropriate. They can match your context.